Amir, thank you for making it. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Thank <laughs> you. 
until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulder. You raise me up to more than I can be. was a pioneer, a visionary, a change agent who enabled millions of African Americans across 50 years to become a part of the economic and business mainstream. The whole premise of the magazine is to say to African Americans from the beginning, you, you too can have a piece of the economic action of this country. His audacious mission grew out of humble beginnings. Earl Graves Sr. was born in Brooklyn's Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood in 1935 during the Great Depression. His influences were his Bayesian American parents who raised him and his three siblings. He started his entrepreneurial journey at the age of seven, 
selling Christmas cards in his tight-knit community. While he was one of only 25 black students in his high school, the budding entrepreneur would find a sense of belonging when he attended the Baltimore-based HBCU, Morgan State University. He studied economics, ran track, and pledged Omega Psi Phi. After graduation, his ROTC training propelled him into the Army as a Ranger Lieutenant. Soon after, he was promoted to Captain. It was this dashing soldier who won the heart and hand of Brooklyn school teacher Barbara Kidd, the soulmate who would steer and steady him through life. Activism and idealism brought him to the side of Robert Kennedy as a senior aide, and then history abruptly changed his life and his direction. Black Enterprise was launched in August 1970. That was the very first issue of Black Enterprise. But the story of Black Enterprise launching in, in August 1970 grew out of something else. Out of tragedy sometimes comes triumph. The tragedy was Robert Kennedy's assassination, which left Earl Graves Sr. unemployed. The triumph would come with this 35-year-old's next move, challenging the giants of industry, politics, and power to make way for black entrepreneurs and executives and for black enterprise. His vision and tenacity would make the magazine profitable by its ninth issue and influential throughout corporate America. No one took lightly to a call from Earl Graves. I mean, that was one of those calls that you took immediately. He made the leaders of businesses, particularly in my case, consumer products businesses, um, aware of, sensitive to, and um, compassionate for the African-American community. And he would use that determination to create partnerships with presidents and open doors for African-Americans in business. Earl Graves was an activist. Earl Graves was a race man, as we, as folks used to use the term, because he was very dedicated to the empowerment and the emancipation of Black people. What he has done for this country is truly remarkable, and how he has helped us to see ourselves and shape our, our financial destiny, the contribution is just immeasurable. He had an idea that was really original, and he created something really special that continues today by nurturing and developing that idea and aspiring at excellence day in and day out. But for Earl Graves Sr., Black Enterprise would represent the platform that would help fuel the aspirations for his family. And it all started with his life partner, Barbara Kidd Graves. She was the best thing ever happened to me. But in terms of the magazine, um, she did it all, whether or not it was writing a piece or whether or not it was uh, straightening out the office because we had a visitor coming or whether or not it was going to a dinner with me. Um, she was always there and always just 100% behind me. And together, they nurtured their three sons, Earl Jr., better known as Butch, John, and Michael, to gain strong values, business and financial leadership skills, and an unwavering commitment to family. The most important lessons I learned from my father was that he never put his family second. Because in his mind, success without sharing it with his family would not be success at all. It was that indomitable spirit that would carry Black Enterprise and the Graves family into the future. Good afternoon. We have come here today to celebrate a man who is bigger than life, one who has captured our imagination, who has propelled our vision into the future and has expanded the horizons of our people and brought 
a sense of hope and justice to our country. It has been two years since Earl Graves made his transition from time to eternity. And it seems like in those two years, we've been waiting for this moment to express our love and to celebrate his powerful presence in each of our lives. And so this moment has arrived where we can let it out, where we've been holding it because pandemic held us, where we've been holding it because we were captured by the limits of how we could reach out to each other. And so as we begin this celebration this afternoon, I want you to stand and give Earl Graves a big applause and celebrate and get it out. Come on, stand up. Let's get it out. Let's get it out. Two years. Let's get it out. Let's get it out. Let's live it out. Indeed, we've come here, you may remain standing. Indeed, we have come here today to celebrate, to celebrate the life and legend, which is Earl Graves Sr. And we begin it, we begin it with a, a small talk to our maker. Let us pray. Eternal God, our mother, and our Father. We thank you for ordering our steps into this sacred space. And we thank you for this occasion of reflecting of one who walked with us and partnered with us, who led us and blessed us, and whose legacy continues to enrich us. And we thank God, we thank you God right now in this moment for the legacy of his family that stands as a credit to his complete grounding in the things that really matter. We thank you, God, even in this midst for his partner, Barbara Graves, to two whom together shaped a powerful portrait of what human life can be and what family and partnership can realize. And now, God, as we celebrate today, as we climb over the temptation of making this a memorial or a sad occasion, give us the capacity to rejoice that you deposited amongst us one who traveled with dignity and character, one who had integrity and generosity. So may we celebrate. Give us the capacity to celebrate this moment. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We will go through the program as it is printed. The Reverend Al Sharpton today is unable to be here. Very sadly, the convention, the, the National Action Convention is meeting in New York, and he pushed himself, which he should not have, pushed himself trying to make it possible. But we certainly want to acknowledge on behalf of the National Action Network that Earl Graves was a fighter for justice and social justice. He fueled organizations like the National Action Network, like the Urban League, like the NAACP. And so we celebrate his role as a civil rights leader. And we thank God for the continuation of those organizations that he enriched with his resources and his vision and his participation. And so having said that, it is my joy to present Earl Butch Graves Jr. who will come with tribute. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you to everyone for joining 
the Graves family this afternoon as we celebrate the life and legacy of Earl Graves Sr. We are literally overwhelmed at the response we have received by those sitting here in attendance and those who are, per who are participating virtually by live stream this afternoon. The deep love and respect you have shown to my dad will never be forgotten. As many of you have traveled from all over the world and made great sacrifices to participate in this tribute. The personal phone calls, emails, and texts have been truly touching, and we thank you for your amazing kindness. As Reverend Richardson said, the past two years have been a long and frustrating journey as we tried to navigate a fitting recognition for my father. After numerous stops and starts due to the health challenges surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic, we were finally able to secure today at my dad's alma mater for this wonderful tribute. Now, April 6th is indeed a very special day as it marks the exact two year anniversary of my father transitioning to join my mother in their special place in heaven. I would like to take a moment to thank some remarkable people who made this day possible. First, I need to thank Dr. David Wilson, president of Morgan State University and his dynamic and dedicated staff. They have been nothing short of amazing in opening up their arms to the Graves family, so thank you. In particular, I want to recognize Dr. Edwin Johnson, Vanetta McCullough, Dawn Scrubs, and Donna Howard for your meticulous attention to detail in making this day possible. Next, I want to recognize my great staff at Black Enterprise. Their professionalism and commitment are truly second to none. In particular, the efforts of Derek Dingle, Genevieve Michelle Bryan, Terrence Salsby, and Yolanda Cook have been extraordinary. Their long hours and tireless efforts are deeply appreciated, and the results of that hard work are represented in the 50th anniversary edition of Black Enterprise, which was the last print issue that we did with my father on the cover, <clears throat> and today's tribute program. And what surrounds us both in this building and what you will see later this afternoon in the Graves School of Business. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I know my dad has a big smile on his face watching all of this unfold in military precision, just like he would want it to be. The BE family is indeed a special family. And once you're a part of it, you will always be connected. I would like all of the current and past BE family who are here in attendance this afternoon to please stand up and be recognized. <laughs> Lastly, I want to recognize and thank my entire extended Graves family who've come in from all over the world to make this day possible. So please stand up, Graves family, and be recognized because there is nothing my dad valued more than spending time with you, protecting you, nurturing you, and loving each of you. Please. Thank you. I got it. This is actually supposed to be funny, but 
Anyway, when my dad passed away exactly two years ago, there was an initial sense of grief. Johnny and I met at his bedside within 30 minutes of his passing. And then sat with him for hours as we patiently waited for the funeral home to pick him up. It was surreal, but at the same time, we both found a sense of relief because my dad was no longer in pain. His suffering at the hands of this treacherous Alzheimer's disease was finally over. You see, the very thing my father was best known for in remembering people and engaging with people he was robbed of. I best described the last few years of his life as, well, I still have my father, but I lost my dad a few years ago. The very next morning after my dad's passing, I made the decision to channel my sadness to joy. As my dad always taught me, you can either see the glasses either half full or half empty. We always chose the option of the glasses 90% full, and we, were, and we were out feverishly searching for that last 10%. There was nobody, excuse me, there was no need for anybody to feel sorry for me because my dad lived an extraordinary life for 85 years, and I got a front row seat of what it means to be a complete man. My dad was strong, handsome, charming, smart, ambitious, organized, hardworking, confident, distinguished, trustworthy, generous to a fault, and immaculately dressed at all times. He... <laughs> He did not embrace the notion or implementation of business casual. Because as he would repeat to me on numerous occasions, Butch, there is nothing casual about conducting business. Therefore, we will not be instituting business casual. <laughs> it is the creed upon which he lived by and is how Black Enterprise continues to do business to this day some 52 years later. As he liked to say, black people already have one arm tied behind their back as they navigate the business world. Why on earth would you put the other arm behind your back by dressing inappropriately? <laughs> My dad was a true original. He was unapologetically proud of his African-American ancestry and would spend his life fiercely fighting for opportunities for black people. Whether on a sales call for BE or sitting in the boardroom, he was never confused about who he was, who he represented, nor did he entertain or suffer those black people who were not, as he said, willing to walk in harm's way. As much of a business mogul and icon he might have become, <clears throat> that was second only to his love of his family and friends. My dad absolutely loved his family, and he was willing to share the details of that love with literally everybody he encountered. He spoke glowingly of my mother, whom he loved, respected, and honored like no other husband I had ever seen. She was his queen, his partner, and closest confidant, and he spent his life making sure everyone knew that. To my brothers and I, my dad was tough, but fair. He had extremely high standards for us academically, believed that physical hard work was a given, made sure we knew that, as he would like to say, you guys don't live in a democracy. This is my house. And was uncompromising in his expectations of how we carried ourselves as young men. Some days, truth be told, we would wake up and wonder, very quietly to ourselves, of course. 
what is wrong with this dude? <laughs> there are countless funny stories about my dad's interactions with us <clears throat> while we were growing up that at the time were not very funny, but in retrospect helped to shape us and turn us into the men we have now become. I will share just a few quick ones. On Saturdays and Sundays, uh, my father felt it was important that he had to have landscaping and work done at the house. And we lived in, we had just moved to Scarsdale at that point, and uh, every Saturday and Sunday in this fall, he would have me, Johnny, and Michael come out, and people would come by, and the uh, workers would come by, or other companies would come by and say, do you need a landscaping crew? You know, you have five acres here. Do you need a landscaping crew to do something with? And he said, no, no, no. I, I, I have a landscaping group. Um, it's called the Graves Boys Landscaping Group. And they do a fine job. And so he, so we were saying to him, he said, Dad, listen, none of our friends, none of them are doing work on Saturdays and Sundays. He said, well, none of your friends live with you. But I mean, that's not... So he's, I said, well, Dad, but they, they need all kinds of equipment to do this stuff. He said, what do they need? Tell me what this needs. And I said, well, they need, need blowers. And he built a shed. God is my witness and those who have been to the house that was, you know, 50 feet long. And he had track blowers and, and rakes and everything we could possibly need. And every Saturday and Sunday, we would be out doing it. So we were, Johnny and I were just two through our hands hurt, and he called us, and he would always blame my mother. He always used my mother's name in vain. So he hit the intercom and said, uh, and the, the military folks would love it, it at 6 o'clock in the morning. He would literally either play Reveille or say at 6 a.m., get up at 6 a.m. and say, why? He said, because I'm up, you need to be up. And he hit the intercom and said, Butch, Johnny, Michael, meet me downstairs. Your mother would like me to, would like you all to uh, rake the lawn, uh, put ammonia all over the outdoor deck. He had a whole list of things. And it was this long pregnant pause. So we waited, or I waited, but it was long pregnant pause. And you have to know my brother Johnny, but he is witty as they can be. He waited and he pushed the intercom button. He said, hey dad, just spoke to mom. She said we could take the day off, so we're gonna go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, they didn't go over very well, but he was blaming, he wanted us to work, and he, he was not uncompromising in that aspect. Second quick story was how we were to be addressed, how he was to be addressed. He said, <clears throat> at a time we were young, he said, you can respond to me. When I call you, you respond to me as one of the three, one of the four things. Yes, sir. Yes, dad. No, sir. No, dad. Those are your only four options. The word yeah, or yes, or what, God forbid, was never to be introduced. And so we did that for a while. And then as I, as I was getting older, I was probably about age 14 or 15. And I had just about grown tired of, he was asking me to do this, asking me to do that. So he called me. I was in the garage one day. I said, you know what? I'm getting pretty big. It's time for me to let him know that there's two men in this house. <laughs> so, mistakenly, <clears throat> he's in the garage and somebody said, Butch. And I said, you know, I just come from probably washing cha deck chairs outside, dirt all over us. And he said, what, Butch? And he said, and I said, what? And he didn't respond because it was just like, you stop calling my name. Stop calling on, you know, what? So he said nothing. So I said, okay. He recognized <laughs> that there must be two men in the house and he's going back up. So I walked over to one side of the garage and then I walked back to the other. And I was walking towards him. That's the last I remembered, actually. I was, <laughs> I was, I was walking towards him. And he reached back somewhere like to Cleveland and he came forward, didn't see it. I just, I, I mean, I could see it, but I couldn't react to move it and literally hit me in the middle of my chest, age 14. And I was, 
my chest concaved around his fist. <laughs> and he hit me so hard that I had no breath. It was knocked to the ground. And then he stepped over me and said, the word is sir. <laughs> <clears throat> The remarkable thing about my dad was that no matter how busy he was with work commitments, he always found time to be present at our sporting events and activities. He would attend our basketball games in high school and college and wear this embarrassing sweatshirt that simply said, Graves Dad, while banging loudly on a cowbell. It did not faze him what others thought about his style, and in classic Earl Graves charm, was able to convince other parents on our team to start wearing similar sweatshirts that he would proudly provide for them. Now, as much as he enjoyed spending time with his sons, that paled in comparison to how much he loved and enjoyed and adored his grandchildren. In fact, one time he told me, Butch, I'll be honest. If I knew back in the day how much fun grandchildren would be, I would have skipped children altogether. <laughs> As you will no doubt hear from, my, from other speakers today, my dad loved being surrounded by people. If you were his friend, you became part of the family instantaneously. He loved to host parties and family gatherings at our homes in Scarsdale and in Sag Harbor. It did not matter the occasion and any excuse to host a party he would do. Super Bowl parties, fundraising for HBCUs, political fundraisers, family Christmas party, birthday parties, etc. By the way, there was no invitation list. Whomever he encountered was by extension invited. Therefore, he created, it created this unique group of friends, and by my, my parents' friends and then our friends, who when blended together, truly became magical get-togethers. In closing, the most important thing I wanted to share and pay tribute to regarding my dad was about his love of people. My dad absolutely loved talking to people. It did not matter your station in life. He treated everyone the same. He would literally walk up to strangers and genuinely be interested in talking to them about their life. And if possible, that helped them in some manner if they asked. It was truly remarkable. Whether strolling through an airport, shopping in a store, attending a black tie business dinner, or walking in a hospital, he engaged everyone. And if you were not careful, you might very well end up with one of the family Christmas cards that he always had at the ready. Nobody was too big and nobody was too small to talk to. The depth of his authentic kindness had no parameters. As each of us grow older and wiser, the things our parents used to say to us that seemed so ridiculous at that time all begin to come true. There is not a day that goes by that I don't think about my mother and father. It brings me great joy and laughter. As I replay, as I call them, the Earls of Wisdom, that my dad shared with me. To my family and close friends' dismay, they keep saying, oh my God, you are becoming just like your father. They are critiquing me like I'm a part of the Geico commercial. But I honestly don't see it. They say you walk like him. You look like him. You sound like him. You are too slow. You are too meticulous. You are too old fashioned. And my response is, if the worst thing, if the worst thing you could say about me is that I'm just like my dad, and thank you. I am proud to be his son. I am. I 
I'm proud to be his son. I'm proud to be his namesake. And God has blessed me beyond every measure. Thank you all. I love you, Dad. I know we all have felt that real special insight into the father-son relationship and that of the family. Our next speakers are going to come in a cluster and each of them have been given three minutes and we want to try to conform to that expectation. David K. Wilson, who's the president of Morgan State University will be followed by Derek T. Dingle, chief content officer for Black Enterprise and Mark Jackson, the grand, rec grand keeper of records for and the seal of Omega Sci-Fi fraternity. They're going to come in that order. Good afternoon. Uh, Butch, uh, what an amazing tribute to your father, a giant of a man who obviously raised giant sons. You know, it is the responsibility of history and historians to diligently seek to uncover and then to capture the lives and legacies of phenomenal leaders like Mr. Earl G. Graves, Sr. I certainly would not attempt to do this in my brief remarks this afternoon. But I do understand that leaders like him pass through our universe just once in a lifetime. I do understand that if you are conscious, aware, apprised, and in the know when it comes to transformational forces, then you must be acquainted with Mr. Graves' name and his life's work. To the Graves family and to all friends and former colleagues of Earl G. Graves Sr., on behalf of the Morgan State University family, our Board of Regents, faculty, staff, students, and alumni spread all over the world, I certainly welcome you this afternoon to our national treasure and to Mr. Graves' beloved alma mater. I consider myself blessed to be counted among those that can proudly proclaim that I, too, knew and respected this legend. Not only did I know him, but I am forever grateful to Mr. Graves because he saw fit to pour into me early on some words of wisdom and then to encourage and support my leadership at Morgan. He was a larger-than-life figure whose mere presence unapologetically pushed you to become better than you were. When you came in contact with those who have overcome such unsurmountable obstacles and achieved greatness, it causes most excuses for accepting mediocrity to ring hollow. Such was the nature of my encounters with Mr. Earl G. Gray Sr. They were powerful experiences that will mean or remain in the forefront of my thoughts as I continue to lead Morgan State University as president. You know, in late 2009, shortly after the public announcement was made that I was named the president of this great institution, I received a phone call from Mr. Graves. At that time, I was living in Wisconsin, and the appointment to the Morgan presidency was a very recent occurrence and there was so much for me to do. I had to conclude my affairs in Wisconsin. I, I had not yet even started to plan my exit. I had not packed or even figured out what I would do with my home or where our son would go to school here in Baltimore. However, Mr. Earl G. Graves Sr. was on the line and he wanted to speak to me. I was both humbled and anxious and I must admit, that I was slightly shocked that I was even on his radar and that he actually knew my name. 
But if you knew Mr. Graves, he kept up with Morgan's business while running his own business and building his empire. Upon answering the call, Mr. Graves' business acumen almost became immediately evident. It was clear that like a prospective entrepreneurial venture, Mr. Graves had done a thorough investigation of my background and my, quote, potential value in the higher education market. He had analyzed and weighed my forecasted presidency here at Morgan and the impact that it might have on the lifetime investments that he had deposited in this institution. Now, clearly understand that I understand that investors are always looking for a high return on their investments. And so it was abundantly clear to me that Mr. Graves loved his alma mater and he was determined that it would not lose any value under my leadership. He called to convey his support of my presidency here at Morgan as I took over the reins and leadership of one of his life's most important beneficiaries, Morgan State. Before the call ended, Mr. Grays professed that he believed in the leadership because of all the obstacles that I too overcame in my life and that he would provide some support that I needed to elevate Morgan to greater heights. Support, by the way, beyond the initial $1 million that he invested in the institution. And he concluded by saying, quote, Dr. Wilson, once you get settled into Morgan, I want to come and meet with you. There were really no words to express my feelings once Mr. Graves hung up the phone. When someone of his status and stature proclaims that they think you are the right leader at the right time for one of this nation's most storied institutions, it does something to you. It certainly touched my very soul. I was empowered, I was encouraged, I was humbled, I was excited, and I was anxious that one of this institution's most recognized and celebrated graduates had given me his stamp of approval. My next encounter with Mr. Graves was during my inauguration in the fall of 2010. He provided some remarks uh, at that inauguration uh, that much as Butch uh, remembered him, they were very stern words. They really went beyond remarks. Uh, they were very stern words of caution, and you can pull the tape. On that occasion, he provided fatherly advice, fatherly counsel and guidance. And he did it by reflecting upon the stage in his life when he was a father of teen sons. And these teen sons had just become licensed to drive. And he said, and they wanted to borrow daddy's car. And he spoke of how he would take his sons on a visual inspection of the vehicle before he eventually handed them the keys. And he noted that, hmm, let me say this to you. There is no damage to this body. There are no dents in this car, no dings, no scratches on the paint job, and it has a full tank of gas. And so before he handed over the keys to the eagerly awaited sons, Mr. Gray said he made it clear to them that he wanted that car returned in the same condition in which it was received. And so he used that example to make clear to me uh, that I was receiving Morgan State University in a certain condition and that Morgan was poised for limitless potential for its future and he wanted me to know that under no circumstances was I to damage his beloved alma mater or wreck it and not allow its fuel tank to go unfilled. That was my first encounter. And then um, as I bring this to a close, my, my next encounter I had with him, um, he actually fulfilled that intent uh, to meet with me from that first phone call. And on this occasion, uh, he came into my office and he was a political strategist. And as I remember the conversation, it went something like this, quote, President Wilson, although you are the head of one of the nation's most important higher education institutions, I know your hands are often bound and your efforts are limited by your status as an employee of a public university in Maryland. 
He went on to say, quote, there are so many important places and spaces that you must visit frequently, such as purchasing tables at business events. And he said, you must do this because networking, which as we were talking last night, networking, 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 he said, is so critical to the elevation of Morgan, and I know you cannot use state dollars to enter those spaces. He said, there are conversations taking place in those spaces that you must be central to in order to elevate this institution's future. And he then reached in his pocket and he pulled out his checkbook and he handed me a check. And he said, President Wilson, you take this donation and make sure that you are part of those conversations and that Morgan State University remain a constant and continual topic for elevation. And so although Mr. Graves' physical presence has left us, his legacy is thriving literally everywhere on this campus today. There were countless endeavors that Mr. Graves set in motion during his lifetime, and even though he is gone, they cannot be undone. And so as I close my remarks, I just want to once again thank the Graves family for seeing fit to hold this memorial tribute celebration here at our national treasure, Morgan State University. Mr. Earl G. Graves Sr. is a Morgan State University icon and easily one of our most accomplished sons. The Morgan State University family in every corner of the world celebrates his enormously transformational life with you I am forever grateful, not just for the example or the wisdom that he shared with all of us, but for his refusal to simply be ordinary. And so we say to our students here at Morgan that we are about growing the future and leading the world. We say this to them and we further say that they would be well served by keeping the legacy and the impact of Mr. Earl G. Graves Sr. in front of them as a tangent what savviness means, what goodwill means, and what purpose looks like. Mr. Graves paved the road that I call leading the future, and I will forever call on our Morgan students to be frequent drivers on that road. Thank you, Mr. Earl Gray Sr., for a life well lived. Good afternoon. Uh, blessings to the Graves family, to the Black Enterprise family, Dr. Wilson, friends, guests. We're gathered here to honor a remarkable man, the iconic, the legendary founder and publisher of Black Enterprise. But to me, Earl Graves was my hero. He was my hero before I even met him. When you grow up as a young man without a strong male role model, you look for a father figure, someone to fill that void. Coming of age, I discovered that role model. I discovered that father figure in a copy of Black Enterprise Magazine and his monthly publisher's page. He was powerful, bold, courageous, and unequivocal. He would not concede an inch to ensure that African Americans gained access to opportunities, their rightful place in society, and he would say that we would need to gain our measure of the American dream. When I read the pub page and I saw that line, I said, oh, that's golden. I'm going to take that line. That's golden. It is kismet 
and it was my destiny to work for Black Enterprise and Mr. Graves. Some 39 years ago, yes, it was 39 years ago, on my graduation day from Norfolk State, I was compelled to write a letter to Black Enterprise, send it with my clips, and ask to be a part of his bold mission. To my pleasant surprise, I was flown to New York and offered a job on the spot. When I met Mr. Graves on that first day, he was still larger than life. Sharp suit, his solid bearing, and those sideburns, you know. <laughs> it was, uh, I was in heaven. I was in, I was literally in heaven. I told myself, I'm not only gonna work for him, I'm going to be him, minus the sideburns, because I couldn't grow them. <laughs> in that conversation, he talked about the fact that we needed to be the beacon for African-Americans. We needed to drive the agenda. And then he told me, young man, there is nothing in this world that you can't do. And I'm going to show you that you can't do it. He believed in me before I really believed in myself. And then as I left, he said, his classic line, every day is Monday. And um, when I left, I kind of tried to figure out what he meant by that, but I did. It was hard work, it was excellence, it was bringing together a group of people that would you know, further advance our agenda. He and Mrs. Graves watched over this 21-year-old transplant from Norfolk, Virginia. I knew I was in safe hands. My mother was very much uh, appreciative of the efforts of both Mr. Graves and Mrs. Graves. He encouraged my personal growth and development as well as my professional growth and development. Not only was he responsible for getting me in the NYU Magazine Management Program, which led to my elevation in journalism, I didn't even realize this, but he would call my professors and check on my grades. <laughs> I said, he's taking this father figure serious, <laughs> thing seriously. <laughs> when I occasionally traveled with him and you know, it was a joy to be with him, if we took a train ride to Union Station, walking through Union Station was longer than the train ride. He would stop and talk to every entrepreneur, every executive, every sky cap. That was, that was there. Everyone was worthy of his time and his attention. Don't get it wrong, he was very demanding. He expected the highest standards from me and all the staff at Black Enterprise. But at the same time, he required that we showed the world our brilliance because he believed in us. He knew that we were the top of the line. He believed that we could make the unbelievable happen immediately and we can make the impossible happen within time. As one of my colleagues described it, we were in the Earl G. Graves finishing school. That's right. You come in there raw material, you come out sharp. He gave me and so many other black business journalists, and keep in mind in the 80s, we were locked out of the mainstream media, especially the business media. They didn't think we were smart enough, we didn't think we could handle the figures, but not Mr. Graves. He gave us the opportunity to chronicle some of the most important transformative events in history. I didn't say black history, in history. And interview empire builders, nation shapers, corporate powerhouses, and yes, the President of the United States. And when I did it, he was sitting right next to me. He also charged and infused in us the mission to make sure that we inform, instruct, and change lives, which we did. 
And he did it all, and this is key to what I gained from him, with his unshakable optimism, in fact, and in fact, at the beginning of each year, he would give us a glass that was half full. And he said, I want you to fill it further. Strategic acumen and classic humor. Being around Mr. Graves, he was just so funny. Um, we gave him, uh, you know, I gave him the term Mr. G because he was um, just, you know, such a human being. He was someone who would not only care about what I was doing for Black Enterprise, but I would come in his office and he would say, hey, pork chop. <laughs> pork chop. Uh, <laughs> he says, how's your life going? How's your family doing? What are you doing to help other people? You know, and that was a common refrain that he always had. He wanted to make sure that you were growing not only as a professional, but as a total person. So in closing, I just want to say that what Mr. Graves gave all of us, he gave us so many gifts, but he wanted us to reach our full potential. He wanted all of us to lead our best lives. He wanted all of us to win. And he was our biggest cheerleader when we made strides and achievements. We, his legacy resides in us. We carry it forward and we will continue his work and we will continue to win. Mr. Graves, I uh, love you, I miss you, and thank you so much for all your gifts. Thank you. Today is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. To the family, to friends, to distinguished guests, to the men of Omega, good afternoon. My name is Mark Jackson. I am the Grand Keeper of Records and Seal of the Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. And on behalf of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, which is comprised of more than 750 chapters with a presence in 16 countries on five continents across 19 time zones and whose memberships total more than 150,000 initiated men. I bring you greetings on behalf of our 41st Grand Basilis, Dr. David Marion, who unfortunately could not be with us here today, but sends his sincere condolences. It's certainly an honor and a privilege for me to be here with you today and just provide a few brief remarks. Memories drift to scenes long past. Time goes on, but memories last. Don't count your age by the years you've known, count them by the friends you've made and the kindness sown. For life is not measured by the years you live, but by the deeds you do and the joys you give. I ask you to pause and consider if today's ceremony had a subscript, it would read something like this gone too soon gone too soon brother Graves. what can i say some knew him as father some knew him as granddaddy some knew him as mentor or entrepreneur but the members of the greatest fraternity known to mankind knew him as a giant in omega a great humanitarian and friend Brother Earl G. Graves, Sr., 
Control number 00301-1244 was initiated into the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated on December the 10th, 1954, by way of Pi Chapter on the campus here at Morgan State College. In keeping with the standards of Omega, Brother, Ga Brother Graves gave 68 years of loyal service to Omega, during which time he held high our four cardinal principles of manhood, scholarship, perseverance, and uplift. Through manhood, Brother Graves served his community well, acting as a strong supporter of the fraternity's efforts to induce change in our community during very turbulent times in our nation's history. Brother Graves was a staunch supporter of scholarship through his support of the fraternity's initiatives to guide our young brothers. Graves led by example as to how a strong education can lead to a prosperous career and family life. Obviously, perseverance is a trait necessary in all Omega men. And clearly, Brother, Brother Graves kept that before him at all times in order to drive him to achieve his many goals and dreams. Brother Graves would go on, I would say, to personify our final cardinal principle of uplift as evidence in his creation of Black Enterprise Magazine, where he uplifted and promoted Black entrepreneurs. I also know that through his many years of very travels, no matter how busy his schedule, he would always go out of his way to spend not just time, but quality time with the Brothers of Omega. And as I was talking to the family, I even recently found out that even when his health was failing him, he still took the time to meet with young brothers that came to visit him in Sag Harbor, New York. And you would think that someone who pledged back in 1954 would be far removed from meeting with younger Omega men, but this was just the opposite for Brother Graves. He loved doing so, and we are all the better because of it. Just ask Brother General Ward, or Brother General Dingle, or Kwesi Fumi. It's no coincidence that he surrounded himself with strong Omega men. For in Omega, we say iron sharpens iron. Simply put, he never forgot about the importance of the fraternity. And I know without a doubt, Omega was near and dear to his heart. Understandably, we are saddened by Brother Gray's untimely departure. We are better able to accept this sad occasion knowing that Brother Graves' presence greatly enriched the, enriched the life of the Omega Psi Phi fraternity. His memory will remain everlasting within his brothers, as Brother Graves was indeed an institution, for he was not just our brother, but more importantly, he was our friend. So brothers, family, friends, let not your hearts be troubled. For Brother Graves is in a better place now. Brother Earl G. Graves Sr. now stands at the threshold of Omega Chapter, where he now waits to be escorted in so that he can rightfully take his place amongst our founders, Ernest E. Just, Edgar A. Love, Frank Coleman, and Oscar J. Cooper, to forever watch over the love, friendship, and brotherhood we call Omega. Being the trailblazer that he was, his legacy continues today. For his legacy lives within me. His legacy lives within you. But more importantly, his legacy lives through Omega. Survivors include the Brothers of Pi chapter and the over 150,000 men initiated into the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. You bid no one a last farewell. You said goodbye to none. 
Your loving heart just ceased to beat. Your stay on earth was done. God saw the road was getting tough. The hills were hard to climb. So he gently closed your eyes and whispered, peace be thine. Thank you. We will now, I will ask the brothers of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated to please stand. And we're going to sing the hymn as you stand in place. And I believe you're going to have a brother come up and provide some direction. Oh, may God dear, we are I know thou art our life, our love, our own. We'll sing. California with Johnny, Johnny uh, Cochran's funeral. And uh, he was concerned about how the program would go along. And Earl made a sign, made several signs. And when the speakers would be up, one sign would go two minutes, the next sign would go three minutes. I'm resisting having the institution of these signs in his honor. 
but I want to encourage us to uh, go forward with sensitivity to that. Uh, I'm very happy to present the Honorable uh, Impume, who is going to come and give remarks to be followed by the two generals who are listed uh, who will come together and make a tribute. Good afternoon. Reverend Richardson, it's good to see you. It's been almost 10 years since Barbara's funeral up at Grace, but always good to see you. Um, and to my brothers of Omega, friendship is essential to the soul. My thanks to Earl's family for affording me the opportunity to join with so many of you in remembering him and in saluting him at this memorial service that honors his life. Butch, Johnny, Michael, the late Dr. Benjamin Mays of Morehouse College once said that he or she who starts behind in the race of life would either have to run faster or forever remain behind. Earl always ran faster. And for some of us, such as myself, he will always, always be bigger than life. In fact, for him to call me his little brother that day, many, many years ago, meant more to me than most people could ever imagine. He was unawed by opinion, unseduced by flattery, and undismayed by disasters. There are those today who will rightfully highlight his business acumen, his gregarious and popular demeanor, his political savvy as displayed through the campaign of Bobby Kennedy, and of course, his many well-earned accolades and awards. But Earl would tell you if he were right here, right now, that without Barbara, he would not have any of that. She was his partner, his counselor, his wife of 51 years, and the bedrock of the Graves family. And oftentimes when you listen to uh, Butch and Johnny, she was also like the judge that got you out of jail after you'd been sentenced for something. It's important to note, as has been said, so excuse my redundancy here, but it is important to note that family was the most important thing to both of them. It was always good to go up to the home in Scarsdale, particularly around the Christmas holidays, and to see how meticulously the poinsettias, the trimmings, everything was in place throughout the entire house. It almost looked like a winter wonderland. And then to go back a few weeks later for the Super Bowl parties, and of course, Dr. Wilson, Earl, and I were proudly decked out in our Morgan State University sweatshirts. I remember so many times how happy he was to have people there and how happy he was just to engage with people. And then there were some of the predictable things that really became the signature of the Graves household, most notably as Butch said, the annual uh, Christmas photo card. And sometimes it was twice annual. And Earl would send it out, I've got a collection of them at my house. And then he'd draw a circle around the newest grandson and says, he's handsome like me. And draw a circle around the granddaughter and say, she's pretty like Barbara. Those photos started out with Judge Bush, Johnny, Michael, Barbara, and Earl, but then came the daughters-in-laws, and then came the grandkids, and what used to be a small photo on a card got elongated because it was such a great family, and that was Earl's way of marking 
his time as patriarch of the family and silently but proudly saying, these are the gifts that Barbara and I have given to the world. Now, General Ward, as you know, Earl spent time in the Army in service to his country. And although, unlike you, he never became a general, we always followed him like he was a general. If Earl said it, you believed it. In fact, he could sell air conditioning to an Eskimo with a grin on his face. You just trusted what he had, had to say. I mean, who else could have talked me out of giving up a safe seat in the United States Congress, leaving and going to try to take a chance on saving the NAACP when it was in its darkest hour? It was Earl, it was Judge Leon Higginbotham, it was Hazel Dukes. It was a mob that Earl put together and he was not gonna stop until he had his way. Now, there were funny things. I remember one night on a cruise ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean when Wayman Smith, who some of you will remember, and Johnny Cochran and myself all got together and said, we ought to go out on stage unannounced, dress like the Temptations, and begin to sing. Well, we had to get the orchestra to go along with it, but more importantly, we had to get Earl to go along with it, and he did. And it was to the astonishment of everyone and sometimes to their laughter. He just loved, really loved to have fun. And he was so witty, as you've heard and will continue to hear. Um, some of you who are here and most of you who are watching, each of you have a special memory of Earl G. Graves. And it's because he gave us so many. I often said to him, what's the G for? He said, it's like Fred Sanford, it's for good looking. So, <laughs> and we will, uh, we will unanimously agree on one thing, that Earl really was a stalwart in the storm. One who stood steady and steadfast through it all. And no matter how long the journey, cold the chill, fierce the enemy or few the friends, he found a way to capture our will to dare to be different. And then he continually challenged us to dare to make a difference. Earl, through your life's journey of 85 years, you found some of us, if the truth be told, hanging out on life's dusty mantle of whatnots. And you found a way to lift us up and dust us off and remind us that we were, in fact, somebody. You took the towering as well as the tiny. And it is what you did in your own way that affected all of us to be here today to give you the honor and respect you deserve as capable, competent, qualified individuals, all better because of Earl G. Graves. So we honor Earl, not through trinkets or false praised or forced adoration. We honor him instead for the simple eloquence of his example and by making it real in our own lives. And we must do that as he often admonished us, not just through our poetry or our praise, but also through our action. Action which helps to remove a large part of our distress by changing the conditions that first created it. I don't know what else can be said about Earl that hasn't been said, except Earl, we love you. And we will love you every day that we can remember you. And we thank you for having walked this work and talked to us and made a real and lasting difference. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. To the Graves family, it is a privilege that I have to be here to represent a portion of 
Earl's life that he valued by his words to me. The old African proverb tradition calls talks to all protocol being observed, so I will dispense with that in order to try to keep with my timeline. All protocol observed, each of you indeed distinguished. I was asked to talk for one reason, to illuminate Earl's career as a soldier, his time as a soldier, what that meant. Graves and I, and I called him Graves. In fact, the first time I met him, I called Big Brother Graves. He said, no, 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 Graves is fine. Had a hard time getting there, but eventually I did after about 25 years. Graves and I met in the early 80s. I was teaching at West Point, and we went to an, an event, and at that event, and I don't recall who it was, wanted to make sure that I knew that Earl Graves was there, both being Morganites, both being Omegas, and him having served wearing the cloth of our nation for the early part of his life out of college. So as a youngster, I go up to Big Brother Graves and introduce myself, and he says, I know who you are, because as was said, he had done his homework. His intelligence was sound. And as a professor at West Point, first question he asked me was, how did you out of Morgan go teach at West Point? He was grinning at the time, but he knew exactly how that happened because he knew what he had gotten from Morgan and I had gotten the same thing. And that foundation that Earl had at Morgan included his time as a member of the Reserve Officer Training Corps here at Morgan. Upon graduation, commissioned as an infantry lieutenant, my branch, on the 27th of January, 1958, on active duty as a reservist on the 3rd of February, 1958, Second Lieutenant Graves, attending the Infantry Officer Basic Course, February to May of 58, attending Ranger School, June to August of 1958, getting the additional skill qualifier of eight, says defining him as a Ranger, and attending Airborne School, August to September 1958, with the additional skill qualifier of seven, identifying him as a paratrooper. First lieutenant, about a year later, in 1959, and at that time when Earl graduated and assumed his active duty time, he had a six-year obligation to serve. He did two years on active duty, and then he transitioned to the reserves, and completed his time. Now, his time would have been over in January of 64 for that six-year obligation. But being an Omega, he said, oh, no, 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 not finished just yet. He persevered. And as a captain, he became a Special Forces soldier, getting the additional skill qualifier of three. Now, that designation is a rare designation, airborne, Ranger, Special Forces Qualified, privileged to wear the Black Beret, the Green Beret. Earl decided to hang on to that for a bit. And even after he and Barbara became husband and wife, stayed with his service as a reservist. And it wasn't until the 27th of March, 1974, after 16 years of service, that Earl decided that things were going so well in Black Enterprise, I'm moving forward. He would later tell me he wished he had hung on for another four years, and I'll get to that real quick here. But those times, those years, as Graves told me, they kept what I was able to do, what I was able to become, in no small measure, I attribute to my time as a soldier. So I talk about Graves as a soldier. Others have talked about him. Butch, great, as a dad, father, husband, 
businessman, politician, but as a soldier, an infantry soldier, disciplined, responsibility, dedication, teamwork, integrity, honor, duty, those attributes universal to moving ahead. Now, fast forward, this was in the early 80s, so as I matriculate, as I stay on active duty, because I, I stayed in, I'd get those same postcards, Congressman Infume, Brother Infume, with respect to where the family is, and Grazer said, you've been promoted yet? And I would say, yeah, I'm a major now, Graves. You've been promoted yet? I'm a Lieutenant Colonel now, Graves, commanding the battalion. Then he asked me, well, how many jumps do you have? And it wasn't until some years later when I was able to tell Graves, Graves, I've jumped out of an airplane and successfully landed 387 times. That was the only thing that I said to Graves that he said, mm, I don't think I can beat that. <laughs> In 2006, when I received my four star, and was the deputy commander of the United States European Command, I forgot, failed, whatever the case may be. I was in Stuttgart, Germany, and I did not send Graves an invitation to the promotion. Coming back to the States, we did a promotion ceremony over at the Pentagon, and Graves couldn't make it. Later on in 2007, as I now leave U.S. European Command and become the first black combatant commander in the United States of America as the inaugural commander of the United States Africa Command, Graves sent me a letter. Graves says, and I'll paraphrase the letter, Kip, you made history. And going back to how he saw the military, not as something that was always going to be easy, but it would provide an opportunity the congratulations that I received from him to this day I cherish. And so when he called me to let me know some months later, I'm going to be in Germany to Stuttgart. At the time, he was on the board of Daimler Chrysler. And I'm going to come by and see you and Joyce, because he too knew my wife. And we would just talk a bit. Well, when Graves coming to Germany, knowing his background, knowing he's my brother, knowing his time as a soldier, we're going to take care of Graves. So we arranged a little, a little deal for Graves, unbeknownst to him, Johnny and Butch, because when he got there, coming to Christmas time, he was going to come and Joyce and I had a dinner at the house, and the staff was there, and he comes into the house in his finest Christmas attire. He had on this red and green checkerboard outfit, I mean, pants, jacket, coming in. And my guys knew that he had pork chops. And when I was in graduate school prior to teaching at West Point, there's one photo, Scotty, that exists where I had let my hair grow. Although I was in the military, I was going to graduate school for two years, and I had these little pork chops. The Graves looked at that and said, man, you need to shave those off, or that's not the real deal. <laughs> but he brought into that. To our house, he had gifts for everyone. Everyone had a gift. In fact, I have a Morgan colored big shirt now that I wear. In fact, we had our enhancement team ROTC meeting about two weeks ago, and I put it on in Graves' honor. Earl G. Graves School of Business. So where'd you get that? Well, it's a personal present handed to me by Graves in 2007. That's been a long time ago. I probably should have thrown it away by now, but someone said, but it was good material, to be sure. Everything Graves did was quality material. So that was there, but as a part of that visit, we got a Black Hawk helicopter, and Graves comes out to this little piece, and he had on this long black coat. And I think a photo of, of the occasion is in the program there, and you all can't see this, but this is a photo that was taken during that visit to Stuttgart, Germany, where after the helicopter flight, the Black Hawk flight, orientation flight around the city of Stuttgart, 
I took Graves to a rifle range. Say, Graves, you Ranger, Airborne, Special Forces, professor, you know about weapons. And he said, well, what are we going to do? And I could see a little bit apprehensive. I said, what are we going to do? We're going to shoot them. And so we get to the range, and I had a young African-American non-commissioned officer, Special Forces non-commissioned officer, a weapons expert, about a half dozen weapons, got oriented on the weapons, and then Graves shot those weapons. I wish I had some photos of the look on his face as he was discharging those weapons. Because I could tell right then he's probably firing up everybody that gave him grief over his career. <laughs> Graves, on that cold, chilly day in Stuttgart, Germany, as he reflected on his time wearing the cloth of the nation, knowing that his service and what those foundational tenets had meant for him were so instrumental in launching him forward to the success that he enjoyed. The dinner, he talked, he used words that I won't use here, describing how great it was. And he said to me, the only thing that would have made this better would be if Barbara had could have been there with he, Joyce, and myself. Then he stopped and he paused. And he had something going on, couldn't tell what it was, but I knew that he was conjuring up all of the past, bringing it forth to that point in time as he was there. So Graves, your impact, your impact as a professional, as a soldier, but as a man felt by those who knew you well and those who were blessed to have had the opportunity to be in your company, if only for a brief moment. I'm privileged and I am indeed blessed to have known Graves and to have him in my heart to this day and in my head for the man he was his character, and who he was. And as he would say, in the tradition of the old army saying, that each one of us and those who would look to come behind us, in all you do, be all that you can be. Graves, I salute you, my soldier, my brother, airborne. Present the colors. <laughs> Lieutenant General Dingle.
The colors are now being presented to the Graves family by Lieutenant General Scott Dingell, Morgan State University, Surgeon General of the United States Army.
for rendition. Thank you, Morgan State Choir. As though the angels came down from heaven and joined us in this moment. We will continue this program with the tributes of corporate colleagues and friends as are printed on the program. We will go by the program. They will come in that order. Thank you. Good afternoon. There could not have been a more appropriate song to be sang at this point in time than what we just heard as a tribute to the way Earl Graves lived. <laughs> to the Graves family, as you know, and many of you know, Earl Graves was my friend. We spoke at least once a week and about a variety of subjects. But I want to share with you this afternoon just a couple of snippets of things that, that made Earl Graves the kind of person he was. That song that you just heard reminds me of something that Earl would do on occasion. As all of you know, you've read the stories about his many board activities. Earl was trying to convince corporate America that he was not the only black man or woman that could serve on a corporate board. He would have meetings at his home, dinners, where he would invite individuals who would come in, CEOs of corporations, Macy's, American Airlines, Roman Haas, he would invite equitable he would invite those ceos there to meet people that he had met and he had a great deal of influence over us as well as he did some of those ceos he would invite them just so they could see that there were other people that were available to serve on corporate boards his mission in life was to make sure that simply because he got there he wanted to make sure others would follow i recall very very well that i met Gerard Arpey, who was at that time the chairman and CEO of American Airlines. And I'm sure, after we met, I'm sure the reason that I got selected to be on that board was because of Earl's influence and his relationship with Gerard Arpey. I'm sure there are many of you here that can give the same kind of testimony. But that's the kind of person Earl was. We vacationed together. We skied together, Barbara Earl, Arlene and myself, we had a wonderful time together and I miss him dearly. I miss the conversations. I miss all of the things that we would do that fulfill my life. I can tell you one of the things that Earl certainly enjoyed that some of you would say to me, they said, hey, he's always so serious. Uh, he, he looks so stern. Well, Earl loved to be pranked, and he loved to prank as well. In fact, I'll share a little story with you that, um, that took place that uh, really shows the kind of person Earl was. He was always, he never missed an opportunity to make a point. We were down at a golf tournament, uh, one that's going on now at Augusta National, and we were sitting, my wife, 
Earl and Barbara, my boss at the time, who happened to be white, was sitting on, a, on the road that was reserved. I was not there with them, reserved for members uh, up to, to sit on that top row. And one of the security guards came up and saw them sitting there and said, hey, uh, you can't sit here unless you're with a member. And, you know, Earl kind of knew what the deal was. He looked over and the, uh, the, my boss's wife said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are people sitting here and there's no member there with them. Why did you, why do you pick us out to say we have to leave if a green jacket comes up? And Earl leaned over to Jane Petrillo and said, Jane, welcome to being black. He never missed an opportunity. He was the kind of guy, he, he, he loved to, to inform people about things that they were not aware of. The other point that I wanted to make, or the, the, the memory I have of Earl, is that he, he was also the kind of guy that enjoyed life. My son uh, got married, and Earl decided, uh, you know, he's a, those of you that knew him, he always had a camera. He always had a camera, and he loved to take pictures. So he was in Atlanta, and you know, was, we were, the wedding was going on, and Earl was taking pictures. He was up in the pulpit taking pictures. He was all over the church taking pictures. A lot of my friends said, hey, isn't that Earl Graves? You hired him as a photographer? <laughs> and I decided to do a little pranking with Earl. So I said, hey, guys, uh, look, Earl is a very, very proud individual. And he's too proud to, to, to let it be known that the magazine is struggling right now. <laughs> so, so do me a favor. I said, slip him five or ten bucks, you know. <laughs> so Earl did not have any idea what I had done. So all of my friends, they all come around. And there were some pretty, you know, prominent people. They were, they were all slipping in money. So I'm... So Grace was sitting there thinking, hey, what, what are these guys giving me money for? I said, I told them you were having a rough time at the magazine, so they were helping out. Little did I know, that night, all those pictures that Earl took, he, in fact, he was at the, at the rehearsal dinner, he was at the wedding and the reception, and he took all these pictures, and he and Barbara must have been up all night. <laughs> On Saturday night, uh, they went out to, to get these pictures developed. And my son and daughter-in-law, they were leaving for Maui on Sunday. They were at the Ritz-Carlton. I got a phone call at 7 o'clock in the morning. And it was Earl saying, hey, I need pork chop. That's what he called you. If, you. if you like, you call pork chop. Hey, pork chop. I need you to come by and uh, pick up uh, something for Shane and Tomiko. I said, Earl, this is 7 o'clock in the morning. They just got married. Uh, you, they're getting ready to go to Hawaii. He said, yeah, but you got to come by and pick this up. So I got up, as Earl has, you know, as those of you know, he will get you to do most things that you, you know, don't want to do. But I got up and went over to the hotel where they were staying and picked up what I thought was something that, a, a gift. And as it turned out, it was a fabulous gift. What Earl had done, he and Barbara had basically gotten three albums. They'd gotten all those pictures from the rehearsal dinner to the wedding and the reception. They had them to develop and he had put them into three volumes, or two volumes. And he had a note for Shane and Tomiko. And the, the note said, you know, this is your volume one and volume two of the rest of your life. Create the, the final volume for, your, for your, the remainder of your life. And I thought that was such a phenomenal thing for him to do. It was a gift that my, my kids talk about frequently. They were able to relive their wedding on their flight from Atlanta to Hawaii in the pictures that Earl and Barbara had basically put together in, the, in this album. And I thought, of course, they weren't very pleased with me coming over at 8 o'clock in the morning and knocking on the door. But when they got the gift that uh, Uncle Earl had given them, they were absolutely thrilled. That's the kind of person Earl was. I have so many stories that I could tell you, but I just wanted to share with you there was an awful lot to Earl. Uh, I enjoyed him. We had a great time together. And I know Butch and Johnny and the rest of the family. I know you guys miss him because all of us that knew him and loved him missed him. Earl and Barbara, I know you're celebrating with Arlene. I know you're looking down upon us now. And I know you're saying, boy, 
I am well pleased with how things have turned out. You had a wonderful, wonderful dad. We miss him greatly. And take the message he gave to us. Enjoy the rest of your lives. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Morgan State Choir. That song was beautiful. Uh, I'm not sure about the timing because it had me and Ron Williams quite a mess over there right before our opportunity to send, uh, to give our tribute. Um, I'm Glenda McNeil. I consider myself to be a member of the Graves family. And I said I wasn't gonna cry, but I'm already failing at that. Um, to the Graves family, special guests and friends, Good afternoon. I'm honored to share a little about my relationship with Mr. Graves. It's funny, he was always Mr. Graves to me, never Earl, even in business meetings, because he was always that icon, a pioneer in business, a leader in the fight for equal rights, a role model, and the consummate rainmaker. And while he was all of those things, he, above, above all else, was a family man, a mentor, and a friend. As I reflect on our relationship, gratitude immediately comes to mind. I am grateful for the gift of family that he gave me and the professional support that was there even before I ever met him. I was a teenager growing up on a farm in a small town in Louisiana when I was first introduced to Black Enterprise Magazine. It opened up my world. The articles and profiles gave faces to success, faces who looked like me. He helped me create a vision of who I wanted to be and what was possible. It is something he did for so many of us over the last 50 plus years. I moved to the East Coast in late 1984 to attend business school where I met Roberta, who quickly became one of my best friends, and then Butch. In short order, I met Johnny, Michael, and Caroline. And of course, central to this family was Mrs. Graves, who I admired and loved. I remember during graduate school, the first time I was invited to the Graves' home, I was so excited. After a lovely dinner, we were all sitting in the family room when Mr. Graves, Mr. Graves proceeded to lay on the floor. No explanation provided. After a few moments, he looked up and said, hey, you, over there, pointing at me, I need my back cracked. Come walk on my back. I, of course, hesitated, not knowing if he was serious. I had just met the man. And he gave me that classic Mr. Graves look and said, I'm talking to you. So I walked over, stepped on his back. He was silent for a second and then said, would you please get on my back? I assured him I was standing on his back. And he turned to look and said, oh God, you're as light as a feather. We all laughed. And as I started to step off, he said in all seriousness, where are you going? Even if I can't feel you there, feel you up there, you always finish the job, so start walking. It was not a traditional way to start a relationship, especially with one of your role models, but it was my first glimpse at the way he communicated with a mix of intention, and if you're lucky, a little jab that told you he cared. Those of us who were fortunate enough to have known him personally saw firsthand the way he defined professionalism and style. There really no, was no one who could put on a suit, shirt, tie, and of course shoes together quite like Mr. Graves. And there are so many others, the millions of readers of Black Enterprise and his peers, no matter race, who he inspired and motivated with his strong entrepreneurial spirit and incredible sense of purpose. Without a doubt, if you're Black and successful, there's a good chance Mr. Graves played, played a part in your journey. His magazine redefined how the world saw us 
and in turn, how we show up. He certainly did that for me. Believing in me enough to invite me to the table he created to advance diversity at PepsiCo. It was 1999. Mr. Graves called me at my desk at American Express to tell me he was creating the African American Advisory Council at Pepsi. It was clear that the intention he had for this council would create significant and impactful change. He told me who he had tapped to serve on the council. Johnny Cochran, Reverend Al Sharpton, Clarence Avant, Benny Wiley, to name a few, which is testament to his broad influence and deep relationships. But then there was just me. At that point, he said to me, I've looked high and low for someone with great marketing and consumer skills. I can't think of anyone, so I called you. <laughs> I was surprised and honored at his request, and without hesitation, he assured me he had given it careful consideration and asked me to chair the marketing committee. And with over 10 years together, we made great progress in advancing the agenda for diversity and inclusion. I hope that at some point, everyone receives the validation I got through his invitation to be part of the council. It was a pivotal moment that saw my dreams come full circle. With Mr. Graves not only believing in me, but inviting me along on a journey to create real change. I owe a large part of where I am today to the many gifts of mentorship, friendship, and especially the gift of family that he gave me. I am blessed to have him as part of my life and am blessed to remain a part of his incredible family. I am grateful. May we all continue to be a part of his legacy. Thank you. Hello, my name is Terry Lundgren, and uh, 28 years ago, I uh, left a great job in uh, Dallas, Texas, running a department store there, uh, to take a job at Federated Department Stores, uh, and I moved to New York City in April 6th, exactly 28 years ago, 1994. Three weeks later, Earl Graves became a member of the board of directors of Federated Department Stores. And um, we, we met at his very first day on the job, and we bonded immediately over sports, basketball in particular, and men's tailored suits. Uh, I, I had a bit of a, a wardrobe collection, but nothing compared to Earl Graves. Uh, and I'll come back to uh, that subject in a minute. Um, at the time he joined the board, uh, he was in addition to Black Enterprise, he was, he was uh, the CEO of the Pepsi bottling uh, and distribution group in Washington, uh, in the Washington D.C. and perhaps the Baltimore area as well. And a couple years uh, after we appointed uh, Earl to the board, we appointed the CEO of Pepsi to the to the board. And a couple years after that, and I always notice Earl and Craig were always sitting next to each other the whole time and always talking during the during the board meeting. And a couple years later, I think Earl convinced uh, Craig that Pepsi needed to buy back his uh, his bottling uh, business at a huge profit <laughs> and, and was uh, very successful in doing that. I'm still waiting for my commission check uh, because I think that happened in our, our boardroom, uh, but that, that was Earl. And I will tell you, we had some very serious meetings in, in uh, that boardroom uh, and Earl uh, guided, uh, he was there guiding me and guiding, guiding others through some really challenging and tough, tough decisions in a tough, tough industry. Um, but when, when Earl joined the board, we had 200 stores, all, all kinds of names, Riches, Lazarus, Goldsmith, and Bloomingdale's, um, and we were about 13 different names. Uh, we did about $7 billion in business, um, and we were just kind of bumping along. Um, by the time Earl left the board, we had gone from that 200 stores to 600 department stores um, and only two national brands, which is a very difficult decision to go down to, to just Macy's and just um, uh, Bloomingdale's uh, and had grown to have become the fourth largest internet company in the United States uh, with revenues going from 7 billion at that early time when Earl started to 26 billion 
uh, by the time that that he, he he left. And these decisions, as I said, that the board undertook, and, and Earl, as you all know, was very outspoken uh, in the in these meetings. These decisions were complicated. They were risky, um, and in some cases betting the company. They were always controversial, uh, but ultimately they became transformational. Earl never backed away. He was a great uh, counsel to me uh, during, uh, during those complicated decision-making process uh, teams because uh, not everybody agreed, and Earl was very helpful to me in convincing others that we had a better choice by making a tough, challenging decision uh, as opposed to the status quo, which we could see wasn't a beautiful future uh, for us or for the department store, uh, store industry. He was also very clear and, and, and passionate about his belief that boards and senior management needed to look more like the communities that, that, that we serve. And uh, we weren't that way when I became this, the CEO of the company. And I'm very proud to say today that Macy, Macy's Inc. is con consistently recognized as one of the most uh, diverse uh, board of directors and senior management teams in the United States. Earl led that, that charge, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm grateful for his guidance and counsel on, the, on that subject. He started to change. Uh, he wasn't afraid of change. He looked at uh, always, to me, always, he always said, as compared to what? And when we were looking for directors, and at that point, we only had, basically had CEOs. And he said, you know, you need to look a little deeper uh, than that. And if you want to broaden your expertise and broaden your talent base and, include, and, and make it a more inclusive and diverse board. We did that. And as a result of that, uh, um, we're, we're, better served, we're better served for that. I said I would come back to the men's uh, fashion subject. Um, you know, er, er, Earl was one of uh, Bloomingdale's single largest customers. <laughs> I mean, when he, would, when he would walk through the store, I mean, the sales associates would all look up, you know, because they said, big, big commission day, you know, er, Earl Grace is in the store. Uh, and um, so one of, when, I, when I, I became the CEO in 2003, in one of the, my first board meetings, I said, you know, we have this thing that's been, been, I've been on my mind for a while, and that is we give extra benefits or health care benefits. We're, we're paying for, for your tax preparation. We're doing, we're doing certain things for, for the top you know, few executives in the company and the board of directors. And um, uh, you know, we're, so we're going we're gonna to take those away and even that out. And then you know, the discount we're, we're, this small group of people is getting is like 40% off of everything we sell them in the store. And so today, I'm going to even all that out. And so the board, you know, basically nodded and nodded their head. And at the, at the break, uh, you know, Earl comes up to me. He said, Tara, it's very generous what you're doing. I said, what, what do you mean it's generous? And he said, well, you, you're giving all your employees 40% discount. I said, no, Earl, no, no. <laughs> that, that's not what I meant. You and me and the rest of our group are going from 40% down to 20%. And so everybody is going to have the same discount. And he looked at me with this amazement. You know, and I, and I didn't know if he was going to just cry or slug me in the stomach uh, that, that Butch so graphically described. Um, so uh, I, I, I do think he ultimately forgave me because he continued to be our largest or one of our largest uh, cu customers at, at, at Bloomingdale's. Um, and so I just want to say thanks on behalf of all of us who benefited from uh, Earl's uh, wisdom, his mentorship, and, and his gift uh, of time uh, for all that he gave uh, to us to make us uh, better companies and, and better people. Thank you, Earl. Well, to the family. It's really a pleasure to have an opportunity to be here and express my appreciation to Earl. I was present at the beginning, but you didn't know it. In 1970, the year I finished college, I couldn't figure out what to do. And all of a sudden, I found this wonderful magazine, Black Enterprise. And I saw people like me in all types of roles, building businesses, working in major corporations, it helped me learn a whole new vocabulary. And then I looked at this column from the publisher, and I said, who is this guy? <laughs> Impeccably dressed, those wonderful sideburns, those mutton chop burns, 
And I followed the magazine and the story that were written. And it helped me focus my career in getting started in sales. Clear goals, clear results. Didn't matter what color you were. And I wondered, you know, what kind of person would start this and have the courage to do it? Excuse me. The magazine became for me a bit of a North Star and a benchmark for my progress and career. Little did I know, 30 years later, I was recruited to join Aetna as president. I went to Sag Harbor. I spent hours with Earl being interviewed and grilled. At the end of the interview, he smiled and said, take the job. You are by far the best candidate the board had seen. <laughs> and then he said, I will always have your back. <laughs> Five years later, I became chairman and CEO of Aetna. And I know how often he spoke in the boardroom on my behalf. I will always remember the day they hung my portrait in the boardroom of Aetna, a 150-year-old company, Fortune 500, number 77. This was a company that had insured slaves as property. And I became chairman and CEO because of Earl. I always remember when I joined boards, Earl sat me down and he told me, remember, you were not on that board because there was a shortage of blonde haired blue eyes and BAs. <laughs> you were selected because you are well qualified, you bring a unique point of view, and you can help them open new markets and make the business more successful. And then he said, always, always be a strong voice in the boardroom for people of color. Make sure the company's employment, its development, its spending are reflective of all the customers it serves. I watched him recruit other board members to his point of view. For my entire tenure, Earl was there. He gave me strong advice and counsel. And I want to thank him for his vision, the role models he shared, the friendships we made at tennis and golf, the events at his home, the leadership events that Barbara put on. I just want to close by saying your impact is greater than you ever imagined. We owe you a huge thank you. And we all have an obligation to pay it forward. Thank you. God bless you. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Womack and Johnny, Butch, uh, guys, thanks for this opportunity. I could very easily just say ditto because we all have so many similar stories and so many similar words, but I think it's a true honor and reflection of who Earl Graves was to so many of us that we have so many similar remarks to say about him. But let me, um, let me go through my, my comments. Just like the case with so many of you, as you have heard, Earl was, was my friend. He talked to me, I listened to him. He advised me, he gave me feedback, he hugged me, he challenged me. When I was with him, he inspired me and gave me hope and optimism that I really didn't know existed. Earl Graves was always hopeful. He was always positive and 
he was all very kind of subtly, but he was subtly demanding. He was friendly and gregarious, so gracious and kind. Earl welcomed me as a friend, even though there were a few decades differences in our ages. He had graduated from Morgan State in 1958, the same year that I was born. And him being from New York and me being from rural South Alabama. I know that I'm a part of a very long list because if you ever walked down a street with Earl, everyone knew him and more than likely who he knew them or at least he made them feel that way. In recognizing Earl's death, the Baltimore Sun wrote on April 14th 2020 that the death of entrepreneur Earl G. Graves represents the passing of another cultural canon. Like the horn players John Coltrane and Miles Davis, he gifted us with the authoritative principles, the norms, the tenets for back black business owners. Earl was not a band leader, but he directed an orchestra focused on improving the economic livelihood of black America. Earl gave us hope. He epitomized that can-do spirit we all enjoyed. So much of being with Earl, it was a treat. It was entertaining. It was just so enjoyable and so happy being in his presence. I met Earl professionally through a partnership with Black Enterprise Magazine and the company I was with at that time, Alabama Power Company. I was a junior officer in the company and in the spring of 1992, he opened his office door to me to discuss an idea I had to promote diversity and recruit, and recruit Black businesses to the state of Alabama. And you say, what an irony that was. He was intrigued by the idea, and we established a wonderful partnership that led to the beginning of our business relationship, but also our friendship. A big part of our engagement early on was his enjoyment of coming to Birmingham, Alabama, and taking time to meet with A.G. Gaston while he was still alive. He was, he was very interested in the South, and I also learned that he loved coming to Tuskegee and loved, loved coming to the South, even though he was from the North. But he truly admired Dr. Gaston and his business acumen and his accomplishments, and he learned so much, as he told me, from Dr. Gaston. And he even wrote in his book, How to Succeed in Business Without Being White, that no library of American business achievement is complete without the story of Arthur G. Gaston, a black titan who is, is long overdue contributions to the recording of not just black history, but American history. Dr. Gaston inspired Earl. I had only been in my company for just a few years before I met Earl. I mean, and I did not have black business role models. I mean, growing up in South Alabama in the 60s and 70s, I primarily saw teachers and preachers as being, being the black male leaders in my community. Earl became a role model and was an inspiration. So positive and so optimistic. Anything was possible. Don't settle for less. Don't limit yourself because you're black. I owe him so much today for the things and the people he exposed me to and all the truth and how he impacted my life. Let me share a couple of stories and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of here. As you know, Earl was a food connoisseur. Earl loved food. Eating with Earl was, a, was an entertaining and kind of an extensive experience. While being in Birmingham on a trip, I introduced Earl to his first deep fried turkey. He was amazed at the flavor and how tender the bird was. Later, he came back to Birmingham after writing his book and we had a book signing and we were hosting a book signing for him at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. And I think Butch may remember this. And we had a couple hundred pe people in line waiting for Earl to show up and, and sign their book. But for Earl, the most important thing was 
have you secured my fried turkey to take back with me to New York? The plane was delayed. The plane was delayed until we secured the fried turkey. I later learned that after he returned back to New York, before Thanksgiving, he and Johnny Cochran had actually consumed the turkey before Thanksgiving. And so they called me on the phone, can I send them another fried turkey? I got to witness Earl's persistence. And one more quick story. Earl would never pass up the opportunity to speak at any gathering. My daughter was married in 2011. Earl and Butch were present. And Butch was going, had decided he needed to go to the men's room and he asked his table mates to make sure you kind of keep an eye on Earl. Earl, being the charismatic personality he is, could not pass up the opportunity to speak to the crowd at my daughter's wedding. He walked on stage, grabbed the mic, began to welcome the crowd, thank them for being in attendance. Of course, Butch comes out and says, oh my heavens, what has happened? Earl goes on to further welcome then, and then in conclusion, Earl says, I look forward to seeing you next year. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes from Earl is that it seems to me that I always wanted to sell something. And he further said, if you ask me today what I am best at, I would tell you that I'm a salesman. We believed in Earl and all that he was and all that he and all that he was selling and all that he offered to me and so many others. Knowing Earl G. Graves was a true blessing to me, and I am so thankful for having known him and been able to call him a friend. Earl G. Graves, Earl Gilbert Graves Sr. was a force in life. We are, and this world is so much better because he walked amongst us. May God forever bless his soul. Thank you.
As Earl Graves Sr. continued to pursue his bold vision and make extraordinary achievements, he never lost sight of family. It became even more important as he started his own with the love of his life. Married for nearly 52 years, Earl and Barbara would develop the magazine into a business success and a voice for Black America, as well as position it as a family enterprise, he envisioned that his enduring legacy of values and practices would be passed down to his sons and eight grandchildren, and a model for generational wealth 
that could be embraced and followed by the black community. Under his leadership, black enterprise would expand to become a diversified business empire with TV, radio, digital media, events, private equity, and more. Earl Graves Sr. also sought to improve the status of generations of African Americans, and with his uncanny ability to identify talent, he would spend his time mentoring and advising young executives seeking to climb the corporate ladder. He said, young man, aim high because I'm going to see some of your senior people, and I'd like to see some people like you in the years to come. He also said, if I can ever help you, give me a call. And then in classic Earl Grey style, he said, and if you can ever help me sell some advertising, definitely give me a call. I would describe the legacy that Earl Graves left um, and built as one first and foremost about excellence. Earl was always about showing up, being prepared and demonstrating that we were more than worthy. So he was not about half-stepping. He was not about not being prepared. You had to be prepared. And that sense of excellence will stay with me forever. What Earl Graves taught us and where the inspiration of Earl Graves resides is in his leading us to have the conviction and the courage to say that, that we too could participate and not only participate, but to lead in the world of business. If I have a lifelong lesson uh, from Earl, it is always to make sure our voices are heard, that you are that you have a seat at the table, and that you become an advocate uh, for those you represent. Through his transformative activism, Earl Graves Sr. worked to end racial inequities, from police brutality in America to apartheid in South Africa. He demonstrated the need for Black Americans to marry business excellence with political leverage for economic advancement. He was more than just a businessman running a publication. He was a force for what is needed to what I believe to be is to create Black economic empowerment, Black wealth, and to strengthen Black politics to do what is in the long-term best interest of Black Americans. When I think about Mr. Graves and his influence, he's been one of the grand champions for people, and particularly African Americans, to have equal opportunities to advance in corporate America. It was his vision initially, and we are in a much better place today because he led the way. He was intentional with his time, energy, and philanthropy including efforts to improve lives with Habitat for Humanity, teach values with the Boy Scouts, and bolster educational opportunities through HBCUs. It gives me a great pride to announce a pledge. In 1995, he pledged $1 million to his beloved alma mater, Morgan State, which now boasts the Earl G. Graves School of Business and Management. He was a pioneer on corporate boards. His work was recognized with more than 50 honorary degrees and awards, including the Boy Scout Silver Buffalo and the NAACP's Spingarn Medal. And his spirit lives on across the BE empire and beyond, inspiring successive generations to promote black excellence, leadership, and financial empowerment. Mr. Graves' legacy, groundbreaker, fierce, funny, human, empathetic, and take no prisoners. So we have this sort of North Star to look to with Mr. Graves. You know, he had this wonderful sense of presence he owned his space. He was courageous in his space. He was unapologetically Black. He was unapologetic about advancing Blacks in corporate America and building wealth. 
I think all of us are um, legacies of Mr. Graves because without him, without the impact of Black Enterprise and all he did beyond Black Enterprise as a leader in the country, without him, there would be few opportunities for people like me. And so I am just reminded every day that, uh, you know, we owe him a great deal of gratitude. When we think about the giants um, in media, and I'm not talking about black media, but I'm talking about the giants in American media, or Earl Graves Sr.'s name uh, will be on that list. And now we'll continue the celebration as we share and listen to the members of the family who are going to come. Let's all stand and celebrate the family as they come and also relieve ourselves from, from our seats for a minute. The members of the family as listed. Thank you for joining. Dear Papa, you've been gone for two years now, but Alzheimer's took you away from me long before, long before. It was surreal to see a bulletproof man slowly succumb to the inevitable, but I find peace in writing you, this, writing you this letter to make up for lost time. Papa, you are and always will be a superhero. You are once in a lifetime, a supernova so powerful that you rendered yourself impossible to ignore. You put on your proverbial cape in the form of jet black sideburns and set out to be the change you wish to see. In essence, superheroes are lauded because they set out to make the world a better place. Superheroes have a way of, pick, of making people feel something. I say this because when I look back at our memories, I can't help but think about the visceral reactions of people crossing your path. Whether it's going through an airport, a restaurant, or a store down the street, I can distinctively remember the look of reverence that people had, had in their eyes. I remember how their body language changed, changed to stand firm, shoulders square, head up. These memories stand out because they epitomize your ethos, a force that inspires people to be a better version of themselves. In a lot of ways, this is still the way that you make me feel. However, as I now embark on this journey of becoming my own man, a black man, I wish I could share with you my doubts. I wish I could share with you my insecurities and fears. I wish I could ask how you dealt with failure, but stayed the course. I wish I could dissect your moments, at, di dissect your mindset at your lowest moments, as a hero's journey isn't without pitfalls and setbacks. It's easy to sugarcoat your life with a list of accomplishments, but to me, you are my hero because you have the audacity to be an unrelenting, dignified black man. You have the audacity in the face of pure darkness to be a beacon of light. I have no doubt that my story will have its own set of challenges, but I find solace in knowing that my purpose is clear. I am in a relentless pursuit of excellence. I will challenge myself to fail and have the will to stand back up. I will challenge our people to bask in, these, in the success of each other because you've always believed that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. I will challenge myself to be the purveyor of your legacy. I wish I could hug you one more time. I wish I could feel the brush of your sideburns against my skin. I wish I could see my jelly bean jar behind your shoulder as you muster up the bass to your <clears throat> Hey, hey, hey! You have no idea how many times I practiced that. <laughs> I know that day will eventually come but not yet. The story of my life, inspired by the superhero Earl Graves, is still being written. In the meantime, give Graham a kiss for me. My story has just begun.
Good afternoon. My name is Carter Graves. I am Johnny's son and the youngest grandson. One of the last times I saw my grandfather was also one of my favorites. We were at his house in Sac Harbor. I was sitting down with him in his living room, watching TV. During his final years, he spent a lot of his time watching football because it didn't require a narrative to follow. And I was never much of a football fan, so quite frankly, I wasn't really following either. So there we were, chatting about everything and nothing. Whenever he and I were alone, I'd just ask questions. I'd asked him about his meeting my grandmother, jumping out of airplanes as a paratrooper, witnessing all the big historical moments he was present for. He'd ask me to get a haircut <laughs> nearly every time I saw him. <laughs> and when he was talked out, which at that point didn't take long, I just threw my arm around his shoulder to remind him I was there. And when I did, he turned to me and with the sincerest sense of certainty, he said, hey man, I am so proud of you. Honestly, I wasn't sure what to say. Growing up, I usually felt a sort of distance from my grandfather. I was never really sure how to interact with him. Maybe I was intimidated. Like looking up at a giant, maybe sometimes I'd have to look so high up that the distance was just overwhelming. Maybe I had to grow in order to truly see him. But oddly enough, at this stage of his life, where his memories were fading away, I never felt closer. When his days were no longer consumed by all the titles, the power, the glory, even the sideburns were gone. What was underneath was far purer than any of that. At a time in his life when he was no longer present on the world stage, what he became in the quietest of moments was ever more present to me. Instead of being Earl Graves, the legend, he was simply my grandfather, my old man. And as impressed as I was by everything else that he was, that was really all I ever needed him to be. But when he told me he was proud of me, I couldn't help but be skeptical. Did he even know he was speaking to me? Did he think he was talking to my dad or Gibby or Teddy? At that point, he couldn't tell me what year it was or which team was winning the game on the screen right in front of us, so proud of me. I wondered. But I later realized I was missing the point completely. It wasn't about what he did or didn't remember. He knew I came from him. Whether it was me or my dad or any of my cousins, he knew we all came from him. And the pride he felt wasn't based in some measuring stick of accomplishment. He simply felt at peace knowing that we were present and that his memory, his deeds, his dreams would live on in us. I think in the end, that was all he ever needed us to be. It's funny. I remember so clearly what he said to me. I don't recall what I said in return, but I know what I felt and how I will always feel. Papa, I am so proud of you, too. Thank you. Okay, so if you're following along the program and can keep track of the eight of us, I am not Kelly. 
Um, I am Melanie, I'm her sister, and Kelly unfortunately could not be here today with us. Um, but I'm gonna read her words and I really hope to do them justice because I know she is exacting like our grandparents and would want me to do <laughs> my absolute best. Um, and we've been through a lot together and I really do miss her today. Um, so Kelly here, this is for you. And Papa, this is also for you. How could a man who's lived such a wonderful life be plagued by the disease that takes these very memories of wonder away? My Papa was a first-generation American and first-gen college student who hustled to put himself through higher education here at this university. He relied on his work ethic and ambition to push him through college and all of his endeavors. After college, he served his country as a Green Beret. Their motto is, de oppresso liber, or to free the oppressed. And I think this is fitting. My grandfather always brainstormed ways to better serve the black community, whether it be through financial resources and business advice with the magazine, or through hosting ski summits and annual events that black enterprise became known for, which allowed attendees to gain insights across fields they would otherwise be underrepresented in, as well as come together as a community. When my papa passed, as I worked through the grief, there is one question that dominated my mind. How could all of this fit into one man's life story? Over 70 honorary degrees, working alongside Bobby Kennedy and meeting presidents from Barack Obama to Jimmy Carter to Nelson Mandela, serving on countless boards, and of course, the launch of an iconic magazine that gained the readership of millions and became a household name. And through my awe of his accomplishments, combined with my immense gratitude for the life he provided my family through his success, the core question that permeated through my mind was how can I make Papa proud in this life? Papa believed in providing the tools for black Americans to succeed in business mainstream and achieve their measure of the American dream. So I lead, my sister, <laughs> a minority-owned investment fund working toward empowering students with financial literacy at Cornell University. Papa said that excelling in business goes hand in hand with excelling at creating opportunities for others. So I, Kelly, founded a business ethics club that works to provide resume reviews, interview preparation, free professional clothing, and other professional development tools that students can use to make the most of their career opportunities. And if you continue to dissect every facet of my life, I'm sure that the outcome would reveal continued parallels between Papa's words and my actions. But I never sat in a board meeting with Papa. I never asked for personal business advice. I never went to a prospective partner with him or anything of that nature. So while his business acumen remains unmatched, it is his core character that inspires me the most. And that is the focus I would like us all to have today. The root of all these actions, these pivotal career moments in my papa's life was his kind heart. He loved his family more than anyone could and was the definition of being community oriented. And while I focus intently on his accomplishments after his passing, my fundamental realization was this. Growing up, it took me years to understand who my grandfather really was or how he worked for years to provide us, his family, with countless opportunities. For me, many years, for many years, he was just my papa. Some of my earliest memories with him are as I cried nonstop for our annual Christmas card photo and over, with over a dozen people there, he elected to take me to the side and talk to me. He persuaded me with love, affirmation, and of course, some jelly beans, not saying anything business related. 
When I wanted burgers for my birthday, he laughed and called me a classy kid and still met me in the diner, dressed to the nines to celebrate. When I broke the news that I lost my first tooth, he gave me a lump sum that would put the tooth fairy to shame. <laughs> and when I miss him now, I imagine his scratchy voice telling me a story as we lock arms and walk away. And I wish I could walk with him forever. As much as I strive to make Papa proud, if I got to ask him one more question, it would not be how proud of me he is. Instead, if he knew how much his love molded me. As we celebrate his life, I hope we can take time to celebrate the before. My papa was a caring, kind, empathetic, loving, hardworking, and determined person long before any accolades. He was full of light and love and passion as that kid in bed -Stuy. If you took it all the way, the company, the school, everything, his love would have molded me the same. He was a true visionary that could always imagine the bigger picture, but it was his love that made space in these plans to bring you along with him, even if you couldn't see the dream quite yet. I ask that we all do the same and leave with love and consideration of our community today and every day in celebration of my Papa's life. Thank you. Hi, I'm Johnny Graves, and um, I'm acutely aware that I'm the only speaker standing between you and lunch, so we try to keep try to keep moving. Um, I know many of you received the uh, the invitation to today, and it said that the service would be from one to three o'clock. This is obviously your first black funeral. <laughs> Our standard is. Our standard is to keep this below the Aretha Franklin line. I think we're going to do that. Um, my dad was a great storyteller. Um, and he loved to tell stories. He loved to tell stories, loved to tell jokes. And, you know, some of the stories went on and on and on. You wondered where it was going. But, but he loved to do it. And he was a real jokester. The thing about my father's jokes is... If he told you a joke and you liked it, that's a good thing, because you were probably going to hear it at least five or six more times, because he stuck with, you know, with the, that joke. His, his, his way of going about just welcoming people, it was always with a, with a, a light heart. You know, the thing about him, everybody has talked about how much he joked. It was never mean-spirited. It came to him easy. And... You know, when I, even when I think about as, as some of his best lines came during when, when, you know, after he had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And he, and he didn't back away from being around people and joking with people. And, uh, you know, it's funny when the uh, group of Q's from Pie Chapter from, from uh, Baltimore came to visit him in Sack Harbor. I was out there also. And he had a great time. I mean, he loved being around these guys. And he always had these jokes. But he loved all the Panhellenic Council. And he used to say to his friends, the alphas, the kappas, and the sigmas, I am sorry that you weren't able to pledge Omega, but you should have studied harder. <laughs> the, the, um, you know, my, my dad, everybody talked about uh, his love of clothes. And he, my father didn't have a, a, a little bit more clothes than my mother. He had a lot more. I mean, he had a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of clothes. And he never threw anything out. So he had, you know, everything came back in fashion. He was just waiting for it, and, and he would, you know, he would get those, you know, he'd get those clothes. But, you know, everybody talked about he was sharp. He was a sharp dresser. I mean, he was clean. He had, he had more suits than anybody knew the whole bit. That was his work clothes. For those of you who ever saw him at a party, I'm pretty sure he was wearing stuff that none of you would wear. Who here has not seen his red Christmas pants with Santa Clauses on him, his, his, his orange pants with pumpkins on him, what have you. He wore stuff 
we didn't even, we weren't even embarrassed after a while. We just knew the damn sure weren't, they weren't, the damn sure weren't going to be handed down, but, but, you know, but we were not embarrassed. And the thing about it, whether it was that or whether his, he had this thing, he loved everybody to, to dress alike. He was always trying to dress all of us alike. And as you know, as you're growing up, I mean, there's nothing that could have seemed cornier to us than all being dressed the same. But, you know, he was so enthusiastic about it, he kind of went along with it, went along with it, and he just got used to it. And then you kind of started to like it also. And, and he, by the way, he didn't just do this to us. He did it pretty much to everybody who's already spoken today um, in terms of, you know, in terms of how he would go about it. Let me tell you when he took it too far. <laughs> we were born in Brooklyn, in Bever Stuyvesant. And at the time, Bever Stuyvesant was, it wasn't just black, it was probably overwhelmingly West Indian. And my father, I don't even know where he, I don't, I don't know what he, what he was thinking about. I don't know where he got it from. But he had this idea. He was dressing me in butcher like, and we were young. We were like three or four years old. And he bought lederhosen. Now, you guys remember lederhosen? Remember the sound of music with the boys wore? The kind of shorts with the bib? Okay. We had, we had on lederhosen brown socks pulled up to our knees and brown high top shoes. And, and this, this, it wasn't October. I mean, this was, this was a real outfit. The one saving grace for me and Butch is that we have no actual memory of it. No, no real memory of it. There is unfortunately photographic evidence, but we don't actually remember it. Um, and, and he is, he's never stopped this. I mean, some of the grandkids alluded to when they went to New Orleans, the four middle grandkids went to New Orleans with them. So this would have been from a young, from Carter at age eight to Gibby probably around age 13. And as I looked at these pictures of their trip, the, the person I felt bad for was Gibby because Carter and Teddy, they were like eight and 10, you know, and Nika wasn't dressed like them, so she was cool. But Gibby was 13 and I know Gibby is like, God damn, I can't believe that. <laughs> that I am in these clothes. He knew he was old enough and he was like, you know, how is it, how does this make sense? But, but that was, you know, that was, that was his thing. That was his thing. And his, his, um, one of his other things was, was of course grooming, you know, and he, I mean, he was, you know, it wasn't just the munch it was, it was everything about it, his, down to his nails and how he looked and the whole bit. And I made the mistake when I, while I was studying for the bar, I decided I had time to kill. I would pierce my ear. Well, for those of you who know my father, anything about my father in business, there was nothing crazy that you could, I mean, he just, he, Butch talked about one hand behind your back and the whole bit. So fast forward, and my son, the one who was up here with the dreadlocks, he went to Catholic school. So when he graduated, he, uh, you know, he I, while he was in school, he had to keep his hair cut short and the whole bit. So he almost immediately started growing his dreads. And, um, and he got both ears pierced and he went off to Brown. And, he came, and we didn't see the whole package until he came home at Thanksgiving. We really saw it start to take root. And I'm thinking, this is gonna be, this is gonna be great. Cause, my, <laughs> cause my, my father's coming home for Thanksgiving, coming over for Thanksgiving. This is gonna be, I don't have to say anything. And I just waited. And my father looked at Carter and looked at Carter and then he looked over at me and smiled and said, life's funny. Isn't it? The, uh, Butch talked about this work ethic that my father was going to, he was going to drill it into us, he was going to force it on us, we were going to do this. And before we had the leaf blowers and stuff like that that Butch talked about, we, ha we had rakes. We were out there with rakes, right? And the whole thing was you had to work all day Saturday to go out Saturday night, you had to work all day Sunday to go out the following Friday. Okay, unless, you had a, unless you had a game that was that you had to do that. But one day we were out there and I guess we weren't doing it fast enough and it was starting to get dark or whatever. It wasn't dark, but you know, he, my father decided he was gonna come out and work with us. And this guy's car broke down right in front of his house. And the guy walks up, the, the four of us are standing there, the guy walks up and he says, when a car broke down, is anybody home? Can I possibly use the phone? Well, my father didn't hear him. So we went in the house with the guy and one of us said to him what the guy had said. 
And my father got so pissed, he went off. This is my house. He's yelling at the guy. And the guy finally leaves. And my brother Michael said to him, you know, Dad, with all due respect, how many people, if you drove past somebody's house, how many people in scars do you think are raking their own, their own leaves? <laughs> so it was, you know, it was, and he had a laugh at it because he realized they, didn't, they mistook him for the gardener because he was gardening, you know? So, <laughs> um, but, you know, it's the other thing, we, and it's, I'm, I'm really surprised that none of his, none of the friends who are business associates, but also friends, didn't really touch on this. Let's be clear. My father did not just put his sons to work. There is no friend sitting here who came over for dinner. My hand, ask any of them later. Ray Robinson, did you ever go, go you, did you ever get the, the, uh, the wood for, for the thing? I mean, it, it, everybody, you had to go get wood. You, he would put you to work on some part of his house because you were a guest. But if you were a guest and he was gonna feed you, well, of course you, you'd wanna help out and, you know, and do whatever it was. And, and they, it would be crazy. It, it got so bad that I, I was playing basketball one time in the driveway with two guys who I went to high school with. And he called us in and he said, John, you start getting the wood. And, and the other two guys, he said, you guys stay here. I go to get the wood, I come back. And I'm like, what are you guys doing, right? One of them is cutting up, it isn't the hand of God. One of them's cutting up tomatoes. The other one is shredding lettuce. He told them he had friends coming over that night. They needed to make the salad. And they're looking at me with this plea on their face. And the one thing, Butch and I were joking about this before, because the one thing that really started to happen, when we invite, we would invite guys over and say, hey, you know, why don't you come over and play ball? And they always ask the same thing. Is your dad home? <laughs> and if the answer was yes, they said, well, well why, why don't you come over here? You know. um, one of, we each got certain tasks that we were given. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, it became your thing. So it was, the raking was all of us, but, you know. So my thing, my bedroom was the closest to my parents' bedroom. My father used to get up at six o'clock in the morning and he would come in, he'd wake me up and he would always say to me, <clears throat> this is how, is euphemism. He would say, hey man, uh, you could get up. I just need, just need you to throw a little water on the car. That was his way of saying, I want you to wash my car. And this was year round. The only difference was in the winter, I could do it inside the garage, otherwise I did it outside. But year round, it used to piss me off. And I'm sitting there thinking, Butch's room is right, right upstairs. Michael's right next door. He always came to me. So one morning he came and he said, hey man, I want you to throw a little water in my car. And I took that as a challenge. So I went and got a bucket of water and I threw a bucket of water in his car and got back in bed. He didn't punch me in the chest. He actually grabbed me by the ankles and pulled me, and this, my, my head hit the floor. But I thought, you know, I was trying to take this a little too literally, and he thought that, that uh, he was going to beat the, the uh, smart ass out of me, and he did. Um, the, uh, one of the things, you know, folks have kind of, some people have mentioned it, other folks have not said as much about it, but the thing about when my dad had Alzheimer's was that, he really never lost his sense of humor. It changed, got kind of dirty actually, but, 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 but he didn't lose it. So early on, um, and he knew he had Alzheimer's. He would, he would tell people he had Alzheimer's. And uh, early on, fairly early on in his diagnosis, he was going over to a friend of his house uh, who, who was actually still alive, Harry Bright, going to Harry and Becky Bright's house. And, my father, Harry Bright, and two other men were going to get together to watch the Super Bowl. So my father had Alzheimer's, Harry Bright had Alzheimer's, Harry Jefferson had Alzheimer's, and the other gentlemen all had Alzheimer's. The only person in the house that didn't have Alzheimer's was Mrs. Bright, who was, you know, was the grown-up in the room. So I said to my dad the next day, I said, well, Dad, how was the Super Bowl? He said, Johnny, it was great. He said, it was great. He said, we sat around and we were joking and laughing and we kept telling the same joke again and again and none of us could remember the punchline. So we, you know, we just cracked up every time. And that was him. You know, he was, he, you know, his thing was he could see the humor in anything. He could see the positive in anything. So he was, you know, it was, it was, um, it was, but it was one kind of thing after another, after another. And I would just, I would just kind of end with this, you know, we are so appreciative of, of everybody who was here today and who spoke. 
And so many of you have spoken about what a great man he was. I think he would, well, I would say about him. More importantly, he was a really, really good man. So, on behalf of the Graves family, I want to thank everybody who was here today. And thank you for sharing our father. Thanks. Thank God for this powerful opportunity to revisit the footsteps of Earl Graves. I um, became a growing friendship with Earl 20 years before he became, he and Barbara became parishioners of Grace Baptist Church. In those 20 years, he did many things as we traveled around the world to demonstrate his love and caring. But I noticed something that he kind of held off on the cuff in that journey. And that was that he was a man of faith. He was a man whose life was grounded in the knowledge of a supreme being. He believed in God. He grew up as an Episcopalian and he functioned as a person of faith. Much of what you hear today, much of the stories are told of his kindness and his love and his willingness to embrace grew out of his sense of faith, his sense of being a, a disciple. His, his goodwill is born of that notion of faith. There's a line in the Mark Ian Gospel that says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? The text is really talking about there is a dichotomy in our humanity. And that dichotomy is that we are tangible and intangible. That we are physical and spiritual. And Earl Graves understood that and navigated that dichotomy. Earl Graves was wealthy, he had many things, but Earl Graves had the things. The things did not have Earl Graves. He was never defined by his possessions. He was defined by the love that he gave to other people. The help somebody notion is what defined Earl Graves. He lived his life with a sense of wanting to pour back. He functioned in that dichotomy even as he, on one hand, he was a great patriot of America serving in the army. And on the other hand, he was a relentless critic of the presence of racism in the world. Earl Graves was a man who did not lose his soul in the quake of his possessions. Earl Graves loved people, but Laurel Graves had a sense of relationship with God that I knew and observed for more than 25 years. It was not formal. Yes, he came to church, but it was a kind of subtle operative in his life that caused him to care about the schools, to care about this institution, to care about the advancement of African-American people. It, is a, it was a function of his own religion that caused him to be so powerful and so relentless. And it was a privilege to have him as a friend and ultimately a parishioner. And I know that the lives of many people are better because a man who didn't wear his religion on his cuff, but wore his religion in his relationships and is a pursuit to lift up other people. The world is a better place. Earl had the tangible, but he also had an, an otherness. And the otherness is the soul. 
He wasn't just all physical. He wasn't just possessions, but he had an otherness and he was in touch with the otherness that he was. And that otherness caused him to live out his life as a functioning person of faith and, and kept his hope alive in the dark hours of his life. He was grounded, as has been said here today, in his love for family, in his faith, and in his character, and his relentless pursuit to see African Americans achieve their proper place in the American dream. Having said that, I want to thank all of the participants on behalf of the Grace family for sharing in this celebration, for sharing your thoughts and visiting and walking back down the roads where you walked and lived with Earl Graves. And may as we all go, may we find ourselves carrying on his legacy and becoming disciples of his wonderful life that he poured out amongst us all. At the close of this celebration, there will be buses going from outside that you may get on, food and beverage is available, and they're gonna take you to the School of Business, the Earl G. Graves School of Business, where you'll be able to share and fellowship. Right out these doors, they'll be directing you to the buses. And now, let us give one final tribute to this remarkable choir of the Morehouse more State, Morgan State University. As we all stand and sing as on the screen, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Oh, the bliss.
Let us look to the Lord. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you and fill you with his peace, both now and forevermore. And let us all say, amen. God bless you.